Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is August 5th, and it has been a busy and interesting week, some might say a dangerous week, in naval and national defense news. On Sunday, July 31st, a U.S. drone strike killed al-Qaeda leader Ayman al-Zawahiri in Kabul, Afghanistan. And on Wednesday, August 3rd, the U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, the highest-ranking U.S. leader to do so, in 25 years. And yesterday, August 4th, Chinese military forces conducted extensive air and missile and naval exercises around the island of Taiwan. We'll dive deeper into the Al-Qaeda story in just a minute. First, today's episode is brought to you by Raytheon Missiles and Defense. The SPY-6 family of radars from Raytheon Missiles and Defense is not just revolutionary, it's ready now. SPY-6 is being integrated on ships across the fleet to provide greater range, increased sensitivity, and more accurate discrimination for air and missile defense. Learn more at rtx.com forward slash spy six. Just a reminder before we get to our guest that we have deadlines on two essay contests coming up soon. Our annual Marine Corps essay contest has a deadline of 31 August and a top prize of $5,000. And our fiction contest co-sponsored with SimSec has a top prize of $500 and a deadline of mid-September. To find out more, go to www.usni.org forward slash essay dash contests. Okay, now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest today. Uh, he's been a guest on the show before, and it's great to have him back. Commander Yusuf Abul E9, U.S. Navy retired. Yusuf was a member of the Navy's Medical Service Corps, but since 9-11, he's been immersed in and advised on counterterrorism and Middle East affairs at the highest levels of the Defense Department and the intelligence community. Yusuf has trained thousands of deploying U.S. military personnel in a military career that spans more than two decades. He's taught graduate level courses on Islam and the Middle East at both the National Intelligence University and the National Defense University. And he's the author of several books, most notably Militant Islamist Ideology understanding the global threat first published by the naval institute press in 2010 and it went into paperback in 2013. yusuf welcome back to the show oh it's an absolute delight bill thank you for having me so let's start with a little bit about ayman al-zawahiri and and what you know who was he and what were the seminal dates and events of his radicalization it's a good question bill ayman al-zawahiri is uh first of all egyptian uh, originally from Cairo, Egypt, born in 1951. Uh, he comes from an upper middle class family. His father uh, actually is a uh, pharmacologist and uh, he has sisters, all of which are, are, are have, ha have earned advanced degrees. He himself uh, trained as a medical doctor and earned his uh, uh, degree in surgery, in medical surgery in 1974. Uh, Zawahri, um, uh, he um, is a product of, I should say, the initially he flirted ideologically with pan Arabism and Nasserism as a as a as a young young adolescent, but um, the some of the seminal events in Zawahri's life uh, was the 1967 war, the Six Day War, which so discredited pan Arabism and, and Nasserism that thousands were trying to make sense of the utter humiliation of Arab armies uh, through the lens of various Islamist and uh, radical Islamist ideas and ideologies. One prevalent idea in Egypt and Zawahri's time during that seminal year uh, in 1967 was that uh, the Israelis won because they had clung to their faith and uh, we, uh, the, that the Arabs lost because they had lost their faith. And uh, that, that had resonance. And, and Zawahri grew up in that ecosystem, if you will. Uh, he uh, uh, dabbled uh, in the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, but uh, uh, soon his uh, ideas became more and more radical because um, Zawahri came of age, at least um, uh, when he was in graduate school, medical school, at graduate level education, uh, under the presidency of Anwar Sadat. What very few people realize about Anwar Sadat is really when he took over from Nasser in 1970, his biggest threat were from Nasserists and Pan-Arabists. He couldn't criticize Nasser because Nasser was considered to be a kind of a, almost a godlike figure in Pan-Arabism. And uh, his biggest threat was from the security services like the army. 
So uh, Sadat actually relied on the Muslim Brotherhood to survive politically by offering a challenge on the streets of Cairo. But that then opened a, a kind of a permissive environment, not through that throughout the Sadat presidency, but through a, a, a several year, years of the Sadat presidency uh, that allowed uh, uh, for uh, uh, various uh, splinter groups to, to emerge. Uh, one splinter group, uh, Sawahri followed very closely, was a, in 1975, there was an assault on the military technical college in Egypt. Uh, Zawahri paid close attention to that. Uh, Zawahri also um, was implicated eventually in the assassination of Anwar Sadat uh, on October 6, 1981. He actually knew about the plot for one day, uh, one day before it happened, but he was implicated and he was uh, jailed uh, for several years of which he experienced, of course, torture, and that further radicalized him uh, in prison. I will tell you, um, we know a, a, a fair significant amount about Zawahri from the court transcripts of the Sadat trial, also from an excellent biography written in Arabic by his lawyer who defended him during the Sadat trial. Um, uh, his name is Muntasar al-Zayat. And eventually, uh, uh, what's interesting is that um, one individual who was uh, involved in the Sadat assassination plot, he was a, an army officer um, by the name of Issam al-Kamari, al uh, he actually said in prison that Zawahri should not be a leader of any organization. Uh, he actually said it uh, to his face. Um, um, also, Zawahri was made to betray uh, other members of the cell. Uh, and that probably explains his quick exit right after his incarceration. Uh, he went on to Saudi Arabia, where he practiced medicine for a while in Jeddah. Um, and eventually, uh, he made his way to uh, Pakistan and served as a, as a, as a physician initially uh, to Afghan refugees on the Pakistan side of the border. But before he left Egypt, he had actually joined uh, and was part of this organization that assassinated Sadat called Egyptian Islamic Jihad. But Zawahri, you'll, you'll see, is a very cantankerous figure, always was a cantankerous figure. So he had a falling out with Egyptian Islamic Jihad, EIJ, but he created EIJ External, which was in Afghanistan that was based in during the Soviet-Afghan war. How he connected with Osama bin Laden was actually through the Palestinian cleric, uh, jihadi cleric, infamous, by the name of Abdullah Azam. Uh, we often refer to him as the spiritual founder of Al-Qaeda. But uh, Azam essentially put bin Laden and Zawahri together uh, during the Soviet-Afghan war. Um, um, uh, another seminal event, of course, is the Soviet-Afghan war and the Arab-Afghan movements. And what those are Arabs that actually came to Afghanistan to fight the Soviets. Uh, that was a seminal experience uh, for Zawahri. Um, uh, unlike bin Laden, Zawahri did not participate in any fights. Like bin Laden, for instance, participated in the 1987 Battle of Jaji, for instance. Zawahri did not participate in any kind of combat or any fights during the Soviet-Afghan war. He, he seemed to primarily uh, serve in a more of a medical capacity uh, during this time while cultivating his ex Egyptian Islamic jihad external. By the way, him and uh, the late uh, jihadi cleric, Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman, who was implicated in the 93 World Trade Center bombing, uh, uh, they both had a vicious falling out. I mean, he's, I mean one, one, one thing about Zawahri when you study him, he's, he's, a, he's quite a cantankerous, uh, egotistical uh, figure. I guess most people like that tend to be that way. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so let me just recap for a second, because that's a, a fascinating journey you've just taken us on mm -hmm. from Egypt in the 1950s. This guy's born in, in 1951. Sure. Um, he, he studies. He's from an educated, you know, well-connected family, which is, if I remember right, similar to uh, uh, to bin Laden's background. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, in Saudi Arabia. So he's uh, from an educated family. He is educated. He becomes a, a doctor, a physician. Uh, he's part of the opposition to uh, to Sadat. Uh, so you're you're refreshing some memories of the Middle East that uh, you know we're, we're kind of. By the way, the Muslim Brotherhood essentially members of it who did not want to compromise with Sadat, like yeah. the leader 
Muslim Brotherhood splintered out into these very violent groups, one of which was the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. Got it. So then he's tried, he's put, he's put in jail, he gets out of jail uh, because he had sort of had a falling out with or made to, uh, to turn on some of his uh, you know, fellow prisoners in jail. He, he leaves Egypt quickly, he goes to Saudi Arabia, then he goes to Pakistan. Um, he treats um, Afghan refugees during the Soviet occupation. This is just a, a what a fascinating story of, of his evolution where he lived. And, um, and you describe him as cantankerous. So he's a, he's a tough guy to deal with. Uh, I'm curious, is, is his partnership with bin Laden, is that, is that a friendship? Is it a marriage of convenience? Is it a bit like uh, Xi and Putin? Or you know, were they rivals who came together just because they had to work together? What, what was their yeah. relationship like? That's a very fair question, Bill, and an excellent one. Uh, I should say, um, uh, Zawahri's relationship with bin Laden began in the Soviet-Afghan war. Uh, but after the end of the Soviet uh, involvement in Afghanistan, essentially the Arab-Afghan movement split into three groups. Uh, one, one group, essentially, um, of, of uh, Arab jihadi fighters, they married local women from Pakistan and Afghanistan and settled in those countries. Um, another group, uh, and they're wanted men, by the way, they can't return to their countries. Another group, they're, they're, they have clean rap sheets and they return to their respective countries. And um, um, the last group is interesting. The last group uh, they can't return to their respective countries. They can't, for whatever reason, stay in Afghanistan and Pakistan. But they end up in Yemen. They end up in, in, in Bosnia. They end up uh, in Scandinavia and eventually in the United States, actually, uh, some of them. But after that, uh, bin Laden reconnects with Zawahri because Zawahri is now cultivating his Egyptian Islamic Jihad and trying to carry out plots inside Egypt, assassination plots, and, uh, and also against Egypt, Egyptian interests in Pakistan terrorist plots. But they link up, uh, Bill, in Sudan. Sudan is an extremely important time for al-Qaeda because from 1991 to 1995 in Khartoum, um, bin Laden essentially takes those three pieces, not and not everybody from those three pieces, and, and stitches together the transnational organization that we today call al-Qaeda. It, it happens in Sudan where he takes pieces of that. Now, Zawahri's relationship, is, he's now much, much more involved in um, bin Laden's affairs. He seeds Egyptians in major positions of decision making within Al Qaeda during those Sudan years. And eventually he, um, he notices that his Egyptian Islamic Jihad, first of all, is, is failing in Egypt. Um, um, I could sit and just do another hour just on this, but essentially it, it involves a kindergartner. This young kindergartner is walking to school and there was an, a, an assassination plot against a minister in Egypt. Uh, they miss the minister, but the bomb maims the kid. She survives, but maims her. All of a sudden, that could be anybody's kid. So people were cooperating with authorities. Public opinion had changed in Egypt against these people. And Egyptian Islamic Jihad began to fail in Egypt. Zawahri was so desperate, Bill, that he essentially went to bin Laden and said, listen, how would you like to be deputy EIJ, external? And bin Laden said, no, how would you like to essentially be kind of my advisor? Notice I didn't say deputy, my advisor uh, for al-Qaeda. So he had no choice, uh, if you will. Uh, another problem, too, is that, uh, and Lawrence Wright covers it in his book, The Looming Towers, is that Zawahri um, uh, was involved, for instance, in extrajudicial killing of members that have that that he felt betrayed him, and there was an infamous case where he essentially uh, murdered or executed uh, two children who uh, were actually uh, 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 compelled to spy and uh, on Zawahri for Egyptian intelligence, um, and their children. I mean, they were basically put in compromising positions, and they were minors, but it didn't matter. That actually uh, really angered Sudanese authorities. Uh, that uh, it was not the factor, but one of the factors that eventually would lead to Osama bin Laden Zawahri leaving Sudan in 1995 and seeking refuge with Mullah Omar in Afghanistan. 
Got it. Okay. Well, thanks for explaining that uh, the, under the uh, the relationship between those two. Uh, my my sense over the years has been that uh, Zawahi has been a, a much less um, public facing leader, much less. Um, um, What's the word I'm looking for? You know, he 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 doesn't have the persona that the Bin Laden charisma. had. The charisma, yeah. that's right. Yeah, right. But uh, I will tell you though, in in Zawahri's uh, defense, I mean, uh, empathizing, not sympathizing with his adversary, um, he, he's a, he's a prolific writer, um, and two very important books for anybody to to read that Zawahri wrote was uh, one in 1994 called Bitter Harvest, with this, which is a scathing scathing critique of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, uh, scathing. Uh, another one is Knights Under the Prophet's Banner that he wrote right after 9-11. And it's almost written almost in a, if I don't survive kind of mode, if you will. Uh, so those are two important books, but he is a writer. Uh, he also wrote a 10 page letter, by the way, to Zarqawi, no less, hmm. uh, that uh, uh, General Clapper declassified. Yeah, the, uh, um, the, uh, at the time, the director of national intelligence. You can find it in the ODNI website. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, yeah, it's a 10-page letter, basically, where he takes exception to uh, uh, ideology that we today call Zarqawiism. Uh, mm -hmm. didn't have, it didn't have that name at that time. But essentially, he says in the letter during Operation Iraqi Freedom to Zarqawi, do you have to be so public about beheading Shiite Muslims? Do you have to give a spectacle? You know, re remember... The, the hundred Al-Qaeda leaders and their families under house arrest in Iran next time you give a spectacle, killing Shiite Muslims. And then what's so fascinating about the letter is that it is the ending, actually. The last sentence, Zawahri has his hand out. He says, can I have 100,000? <laughs> it, it shows you that the, um, I should say, the uh, Frankenstein monster they created with, Zar with Zarqawi as leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq would actually have repercussions and implications to to Al Qaeda senior leaders like Zawahri and Bin Laden when he was alive. Interesting. So, yeah. so when Bin Laden was killed, was it pretty, you know, obvious and, and almost automatic that Zawahri became Bin Laden's successor, or was there a struggle with others? Oh, that's a that's a fantastic question and very pertinent today, as we talk about succession. Uh, it's important to realize that it, it took the better part of six months before it became clear that Zawahri uh, uh, essentially gained the allegiance of Al Qaeda franchises in Yemen and in North Africa. Um, there was uh, it wasn't automatic because you got to understand, Bill uh, Osama bin Laden never actually ever ever designated Zawahri as his deputy, as his successor. Um, there was discussion about possibly uh, Hamza bin Laden, who we neutralized uh, in the last administration. Um, Hamza bin Laden, bin Laden's son, being a potential successor. But there is nothing that says that Zawahri uh, was going to be the deputy or be the. So he had to actually, um, I should say, for lack of a better term, politic, if you will, and cajole and convince and threaten uh, in order to get the allegiance. Of, of, of Al Qaeda franchises, uh, and, and it's something to watch for uh, as we see uh, who, the, what what the post Zawahri Al Qaeda will look like, because Al Qaeda, aside from dealing with succession, they're also dealing with a generational issue. Uh, you got to understand that, uh, depending on who, who who succeeds Zawahri, if it's for instance Saif al Adil, that's Zawahri's generation. Um, if it's his son-in-law, well, that's a, another generation, but you know, it, it, it's, it's not the, it's not the kind of ISIS generation to give you a kind of a comparison. Zawahri, we said was born in 1951. Well, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the, the, the former ISIS caliph, uh, who was killed, um, that he was born in 1972, 71. So there's a 20 year generational difference between ISIS and Al-Qaeda. The baptism of fire we discussed for Zawahri and bin Laden was the Soviet-Afghan war. The baptism of fire for ISIS is Operation Iraqi Freedom. So it, it, it's a, it's a, there's a generation, they, they're also struggling generationally within Al-Qaeda. Um, will they select Saif al-Adil? Uh, that's the leading name that's being bandied about in, in media. Uh, Saif al-Adil is, uh, I mean, he's 
approaching Zawahri's age uh, in his late 60s, early 70s. So he's not a young man. Um, so Saif al-Adil used to be a, uh, an, an Egyptian major uh, in the Egyptian special forces before he was cashiered for radicalism. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's been in Iran really since 9-11, which calls us to suspect the, the degree of influence the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps has uh, on him um, among other Al-Qaeda operatives. They'll, they'll be suspect to trust him. Uh, his son-in-law, his name is al Maghrebi, so his son-in-law is another contender. Uh, but he has, frankly, openly stated, I don't want to be a leader. I'm <laughs> very happy being a media man and running al-Sahab, their, their channel. So then the question then becomes, if it's not those two, will the franchisees just go ahead and declare, you know, hey, I am the leader of al-Qaeda. I don't care what anyone says. And 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 follow me essentially. Yeah, so no, that's that's fascinating. I, I want to ask. I, I think a lot of people would, are probably wondering, you know, how do these different franchises that are in different places, Afghanistan and Pakistan and in Yemen and and uh, you know Iraq, etc. How do they how do they communicate these days? How are they? How will they make this decision across the you know the Al Qaeda uh, kingdom, if you will, or caliphate, or whatever you want to call it, but how do, how do they, you know, they obviously can't all fly and get together and have a, a national, you know, a convention and elect their next leader. How do they do it? Well, I mean, they, they do it through, they do it because of security reasons, although one could argue Zawahri's security kind of lapsed there yeah. uh, <laughs> last week. But essentially, it's, it's still done primarily through couriers, mm -hmm. uh, through couriers and um, um, um I don't, I, I, unfortunately, uh, the nice thing about the bin Laden raid is that God bless the seals. They, they, not, they not only uh, did the job and, uh, but they also left, they also left the compound with literally hundreds of CDs and thumb drives. And that, and that essentially gave us a good picture on the frustrations, frankly, of how bin Laden communicated. And it also gave us uh, insights into the frustrations that franchisees were kind of like, yes, Emir, we yes, we listen to you, we love you, but they really, you know, listen, you're not here. We're actually on the ground, you know. They didn't really take his advice as as an order, if you will. It's kind of like noted, you know what I mean? And I, I'm 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 speculating now that I think Zawahri probably was suffering from the same issue, if not worse, because as we discussed, Zawahri had uh, less charisma. In the grand scheme of things, as far as ideologically. Uh, Zawahri, um, the problem with Zawahri towards the la last couple of years, last five years, is that uh, we would be treated to his infamous monologues. And it, frankly, it's almost like you needed a bachelor's degree in MIDI studies to understand the guy. And for today's ISIS fanboys and hashtag jihadis, it seems like Zawahri did, never got that. He never got that. And it's not from the lack of trying by other younger Al-Qaeda media guys uh, that are, were attempting to kind of say, no, you need some whiz bang. You know, you need some, you know, so he just would give us those. I mean, I enjoyed it because to me it was like a history lesson and I would dive into it and, and unpackage it. But uh, uh, with, the with the death of Zawahri, that generation of kind of, People uh, waxing eloquent about the Sykes Picot Agreement in World War One and the Ottomans and uh, Ibn Taymiyyah from the 13th century. Um, I'm not going to be. We're not going to be seeing those individuals anymore. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, that's fascinating. If it's not 120 characters or less, uh, it, it's not going to cut it anymore. So right, right. Yeah. Uh, a shout out. You mentioned the seals and and you know that the trove of information that they left the compound with and. You know, that that um, process is called SSE or sensitive site exploitation, right? It's, you know, go Got in and go in and get the bad guys, kill the bad guys, seize them, seize them but also get as much information as you can. And yep. then that feeds into the, you know, the intelligence cycle, the targeting cycle, find, fix, <laughs> and sure finish yeah, yeah. the next folks. So uh, okay. great stuff. Um, you also mentioned about the franchisees. It really, the happening place as far as Al-Qaeda Al and counterterrorism is actually Africa. And uh, oh. the leader of Al-Shabaab, uh, uh, his name is Ahmed Direy, 
uh, if he if he openly says declare, declares himself as the leader of Al Qaeda, that's not what I mean. That's for one well, tactically, operationally, from an Al Qaeda perspective, that's a good idea. But now you've run into the frankly abject racism, where you've got the leaders of Syria and North Africa and Yemen saying, "I'm not going to follow an African guy. Uh, oh, he's not Arab." You know, all that business starts yeah. rearing. It, which actually is good for us. This kind, these yeah. kind of divisions are, are frankly good for us. Right. So Al Shabaab being in uh, the, the the Somalia in Somalia and in uh, Ethiopia, by the way, as we speak. Got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. um, so back for a second, because you mentioned, you know, uh, Zawahiri was killed in Afghanistan and uh, mm -hmm. you know, on the outskirts of uh, Kabul in, in kind of a upscale neighborhood. Um, and the question that's uh, I've heard numerous, all the, re the news reporting and, and uh, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, all saying, did the Taliban know he was there? And were they complicit? Were they supporting him? Were they, were they, um, you know, did they allow him to be there? And of course, the Taliban spokesman this week is saying, oh, no, we didn't know he was there. Right. What do you think? Well, I mean, unlike the bin Laden raid, we're, we're honestly, there was no smoking gun. You know what I mean? No smoking gun. This raid is very, very different in that, uh, first of all, he's living in, in, a, in, a, in what we call a poppy house. It used to be a former drug lord's house, mm -hmm. um, a poppy house that's owned by Sirajuddin Haqqani, uh, who is the minister of interior currently in the government of Afghanistan. And, and the Haqqani network is, is, is embedded. Uh, with the current Taliban regime and the Taliban government, so, the so-called government, I should say. Uh, so uh, I I uh, I find it very 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 hard to believe the Taliban spokesman. And another reason I say that is uh, when when the Doha agreement was being negotiated, um, uh, I was one of those individuals that said there is no way. No way you're going to divorce the Taliban from Al Qaeda and the Haqqanis. They've got grandchildren together. You know what I mean? Their relationship goes back to the Soviet Afghan war. And, and they've got such a they've got family history that stretches three generations. They, I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll tell you what you want to hear. They'll give you the yes, but treatment. For those of you not familiar with the yes, but treatment, that's essentially where someone says, tell, tell them yes on everything. And don't refuse them anything, but we'll walk it back in the execution. Uh, it's called the yes, but treatment. Uh, when you operate in the region, you, you, you better get used to that uh, uh, from some corners. And, and that was being done in the Doha agreement, from my perspective, at least, uh, the, of 2020, that brokered uh, the, the uh, Taliban's uh, return back to Afghanistan. I'd like to highlight just for a second uh, another book that you've written that the Naval Institute published three years ago. It was called Middle East 101. Uh, we had you on the podcast uh, at that time to talk about this. You, you, you know, co-authored that with Joe Stanek. And that was just a it's great foundational knowledge for people who are you know, like me, um, didn't grow up in the Middle East, uh, spent some time there or were getting ready to deploy there and wanted to know more about it. But um, you're not just a uh, Middle East Islamic extremist expert, but also uh, an expert on the region. So uh, thanks for writing that as well. You wrote um, that for the troops. <laughs> what's that? I wrote that for the troops. You wrote it for the troops. No, great, great contribution. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to uh, reference another thing that you wrote. This is, goes back almost 20 years now, but you uh, wrote a, a monograph for the I did. U.S. Air Force Air University Future Warfare Series on Zawahiri. How did that come to be? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, first of all, uh, it, it, that, that monograph, uh, 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 biography of Zawahiri, was the first one I did, the very first one. It was published in March of 2004. And um, it, it, at the time, I was working um, as the director for North Africa and Egypt and the assistant director for Arabian Gulf Affairs uh, at the Office of Secretary of Defense uh, for Policy uh, when the, the late Secretary Don Rumsfeld was Secretary of Defense. And uh, I was very privileged. I was very privileged to be part of an interagency group and team of, of colleagues, men and women, that essentially stitched together the architecture of what would become the global war on terrorism, um, uh, from the Sahel all the way to the Persian Gulf region. And um, um, it, it goes back really to, at the time, uh, my immersion in the 
in the region and in the global war on terrorism. But also, um, there was such a hunger, uh, a, th a thirst, uh, Bill, after uh, after 9-11 for a biography of, of the Al-Qaeda leaders, like bin Laden and Zawahiri. And uh, I had in the ninety in the in late nineties and in, in mid in the mid to late nineties I had actually made it my business as a junior naval officer to uh, to uh, expose American military readers to uh, memoirs that were written by various Arab and North African generals, even Hamas operatives, and I got my writing start actually in in essays and and exposing that material in U.S. Army magazines like Infantry, Journal, and Military Review. Um, so I had already had that background when 9-11 occurred. There was a dire need, and that's why I my career essentially changed from Medical Service Corps to 21 out of my 28 years being in the global war on terror, global war on terrorism, because it was a dire need for Arabic linguists uh, right after 9-11, dire. So, um, um, I began writing the Zawahri uh, biography in 2002, so a year after 9-11 is when I began it. And I was inspired, actually, by the work um, of Dr. Gerald Post, if you remember him from the CIA, the late Dr. Gerald Post, the father of leadership analysis mm. in the CIA. He wrote some amazing biographies of various dictators uh, around the world, getting inside their head and their psychology. So what I did was, is, is I, I gathered together various Arabic sources, uh, because that's where you found things on Zawahri, is from Arabic sources, like that lawyer we talked about, who wrote a biography of Zawahri, the, the Sadat transcript of the trial, where Zawahri speaks in his own voice. Um, I began gathering those materials and then uh, pounding away at, um, at, uh, at the monograph. Now, Dr. Post had actually written for the Future Warfare series. So I, I went and proposed wow. it to the Air Force. And I said, hey, listen, I got, I'm working on this biography of Zawahri. And, I'm, I'm, and, and the reason I'm calling you is because I'm reading what you're releasing from Dr. Post. And, uh, and the, the, frankly, the rest was history. They said, yeah, sign us up. Uh, and that became my very first monograph. My very first, I should say, standalone book was a biography of Zawahri. I didn't realize that uh, almost 20 years, oh, close to almost about tw two decades later, that uh, it, all of a sudden I'd see it pop up all over the place all the, this week in, in, in syndicated media. So uh, they are quoting and citing from it. Uh, but what I tried to give the reader is really a, a, a deep understanding as best as possible into the psychology of Zawahri, who he is uh, as a person, uh, if you will. Fascinating. So, yeah. 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 Hey, um, Yusuf, I wanted to ask you a question that I've heard posed to John Kirby, the National Security Council spokesman uh, and former Pentagon spokesman uh, this week in the in the wake of the uh, Al Zawahri uh, killing, which is uh, the question was. Um, does this make Americans safer now, or are we in a period of uh, where there's going to be some turmoil with Al Qaeda as they figure out who their next leader and, and things might be actually more dangerous? Uh, in in my view, I think uh, neutralizing Zawahri does make America safer, and the reason I say that is um, uh, I have done I have been involved in the global war on terrorism for two decades. Uh, for 21 out of my 28 years of active duty. And it, it, it's it's a constant management problem. You have to constantly manage the problem. It's like wearing down the nub. You got to constantly wear down the nub. And I hate to use a cliche, like mowing the grass, if you will. Um, uh, so it, it makes us safe in the sense that it, it first of all, uh, uh, causes a crisis within the organization, within Al-Qaeda. Uh, it, it, it causes, um, it, it, it frankly uh, allows us to better understand clearly, if you will, in my opinion, the, the, the Taliban's intentions uh, going forward. Um, and um, so I think it, it does make us safer. Uh, now, that said, I will tell you, there are um, um, it, 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 
terrorism while it is not an existential threat to the United States, but it does require management. So tier one threats, those are existential threats, is of course great power competition with Russia and China. Those are existential threats. Tier two threats are North Korea and Iran. And tier three threats would be uh, you know, terrorism, uh, ISIS, Al Qaeda, and all its affiliates. So uh, it re still requires management, uh, if you will. Yeah, we have, we have a couple. Sorry, I, w I was not paying attention to the chat. I've been so fascinated with your uh, responses to my questions. Uh, we've got a couple uh, folks on the chat uh, listening to this. And the uh, first great question, Austere Roberto asks, does this provide proof of concept for the over the horizon strategies? So there's, you know, uh, I just talked about it. Uh, the US Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, no, I, I uh, uh, yeah, uh, yes, Austere, I, I, in my, in my view, uh, my problem with over the horizon strategy is, is uh, um, the, the, le the level of pattern of life needed to uh, establish the presence of Zawahri in that location. And then, of course, taking the shot when he was on the balcony. Um, you know, it, it, it I, I'm not a fan, my, it's just my own personal opinion. Y you still need, I think, a, a U.S. presence in the, on the ground, if nothing else, to minimize collateral damage. My problem with over the horizon strategy is that it, 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 it's not as, I mean, Zawahri is probably an anomaly, but it's, it's not as precise because you need eyes on the ground. You need people on the ground. Um, so, uh, uh, and the question, any like likely successor to Al Qaeda leadership, uh, austere, uh, the candidates are Saif al Adel and Al, and al Maghrabi, who are in Iran. And then, of course, the franchisee leader of Al Qaeda in Arabian Peninsula, Yemen, his name is Khaled Batarfi. Uh, another individual is in Somalia, his name is Ahmed Dirai. Um, these are perhaps the leading contenders, if you will. Each one, by the way, comes with their own pros and cons, pros and cons. My biggest question too is going to be, is Al Qaeda going to make, finally make that generational shift, if you will, um, that ISIS has been, as, as its competitor, uh, has masterfully executed, uh, if you will. Uh, yeah. Other questions, please. Yeah, one, one more, last question, we're, we're running out of time here, but uh, Antonio Briccio asks, would you believe that the clerics today are losing touch with current day jihadists. You touched on this a little bit about the, the age difference, the, de, you know, the, the generational difference. Uh, yeah. what, do, what do you think about that? Would you believe that the clerics, uh, my question is cleric is a broad term. I mean, okay. there's clerics, Sunni clerics, Sufi clerics. Um, uh, there are frankly, I mean, in 2022, the Middle East is not immune to, uh, to for instance, the United States. So we, we do have our, vo our, 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 our Islamic form of, of rock star televangelists, uh, if you will. So um, uh, now, I guess the, the 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 question is 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 from my perspective, um, uh, losing touch with the current day jihadists. It, frankly, I, I'd like to answer your question from the from the current day jihadists. Your, your current day jihadist essentially. Um, in their own minds, the ends justifies the means. So for them, if religion or Islam matters at all to them, um, and, and, they, and they presume to speak in the name of Islam, of course, and to, to conduct their heinous acts in the name of Islam, uh, then what they typically do is they do what I call fatwa shop, which is very easy online. They, they find opinions, they find views, they they go online, they go on social media, and they create an echo chamber, if you will. They're not going to go and, and, and get a formal uh, cleric in, in say, a, a, a mosque uh, to uh, endorse their, their points of view. The days of finding jihadis in mosques is really dwindling. It's, it's, uh, they're mainly online and on social media. In the in the late twenty first in the in twenty twenty two and twenty twenty and beyond in social media is where you find them. As far as clerics losing touch with current day jihadists, there's another. It's double edged swords. Are clerics losing touch with the current day Muslims? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I mean, there's uh, 
uh, you you see that, for instance, in Iran, for instance, among the clergy there. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I, unless you want to ask a specific question about a certain cleric or or maybe just Wahhabi clerics or something, um, you know, I I'm, I'd be happy to stay on stay on and and maybe add more precision to 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 the answer. Yeah, maybe we could follow that up with uh, with email. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. This has just been a fascinating conversation. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm, I'm Thanks glad. for providing so much of the historical context and and the details on uh, behind this this man, uh, the, the former Al Qaeda leader uh, Ayman al Zawahiri, mm -hmm. who was killed in Afghanistan uh, last Sunday by a U.S. drone strike. Uh, so our guest today has been Commander Yusuf Abul E9. Naval Institute Press, a proceedings author, an expert on Al-Qaeda and Islamic extremism. It was great to have you back on the show, Yusuf. If I could say just one last thing. It, 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 our most important asset, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm glad to say Naval Institute contributes to this, is the, the intellectual capital of our men and women, our intellectual capital. That's our most important asset. I mean, uh, uh, SEALs don't get to their target. Hellfire missiles don't get to their target without some serious intellectual capital. So I just wanted to close with that. Thanks for making that plug. I couldn't agree more. Uh, well, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast. Thanks to our producer, Heather Legg. Also, this episode is brought to you by Raytheon. Raytheon Missiles and Defense is setting the pace of performance with the SPY-6 family radars actively being integrated across the fleet. SPY-6 provides the clearest possible picture of the battle space with modular multi-mission capabilities that make it the most advanced radar on Earth. Learn more at rtx.com forward slash spy six. Remember, until next episode, victory begins at the Naval Institute. We'll see you again soon.